Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, recovered off the hall. Careful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, happy holidays to everyone. And uh, I get to share tonight on uh, step 11, uh, probably a little bit of 10, and what that currently looks like for me and how I got there. Um, interesting thing about 11 is uh, most folks don't practice step 11, although we give a great lip service. Um, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988, and uh, my first six months into AA wasn't a healthy uh, uh, residency here. It was uh, uh, sketchy at best. Um, I wasn't drinking. I was going to meetings and um, ran to meeting, to meeting, to meeting, and looking for that golden cave, something that was going to ignite me. And um, it's kind of like the pot of gold was right in front of me, and I kept looking down the block. Um, I bottomed out uh, almost six months to the day in Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, I'm glad no one got in the way of my bottom, although they tried a few times to let me bottom out. Uh, and without picking up a drink, I was, uh, uh, again, at my wit's end in, in AA sober, and um, which is just as painful as when you're out there drinking and doing other things because I had no medicine to, to wash the night away. It was me and my mind, which only, and the mind makes a great servant but a terrible master, and it was my God. Now, lots of times people tell me uh, when they're new in AA that uh, they don't believe in God, they have a problem with God, or they're, they're proud atheists, and I just point to the fact that they've been worshiping their mind the longest time. They have no problem worshiping anything. The mind's been their God, uh, and that's what was going on with me. It was full of the future. It was regrets with the past, and I couldn't be present, and uh, the drink was on me, and uh, I bought an out, and I found some teachers, and they started taking me to the work and I start to uh, catch uh, this thing that they were talking about, this power called God. And I start to experience some ease and comfort for the first time in my life. And the external world didn't change. I was still broke. I was still doing these little sober jobs, mowing lawns, driving car service, I mean, whatever I can make a couple of bucks with. Uh, I still didn't have a lot of clothes. I had nothing. And I wasn't given permission to go home yet. So the external world looked the same, pretty much. But I wasn't on the inside. My internal condition was being changed by God's touch. And uh, I was suiting up and showing up and uh, getting to the my little altar, if you will, twice a day, in the morning on awakening and at night on retiring. And um, no one told me to, but to the gift of desperation, I found myself throwing myself at the mercy of God and begging to stay clean and sober and begging uh, uh, to make right what was so wrong in my life. And I didn't even know anymore. Um, relationships were the farthest thing from my mind. I didn't think I needed to be with anyone to be right. Thank God for that. A lot of us think, if I only find him or her, everything's going to be great. That was removed. Going home was removed. Uh, Making money was removed. I was trying to survive. I would say there's been about half a dozen times in my 25 years sober that um, I've had my back against the wall and not knowing what the next day was even going to bring. And uh, thank God there was no drink in the middle of that. But my back's been against the wall. And when there was nowhere else to turn but back to God, uh, on my knees and asking for mercy, they've always turned out to be the most intimate moments with God, Um, the most productive moments with God. And the external world, again, didn't change. Uh, what changed was I got a GPS, and I was able to navigate through this. Oh, what would God want me to do? What would God want me to do? What would God want me to do? Now, we can do that when we got 20 minutes sober. But the thing was, I was now believing in this power I was praying to. And I was not believing in me and my mind and my way of doing things. And I found out quickly, anytime I try to say, I'm going to figure it out, I'm practicing dishonesty, self-reliance, and I'm in time manageability and fear. And so uh, through the gift of desperation, that started to happen for me. 
And uh, along the way, I start to feel a lot better. And I met some great teachers, some really great teachers that on my best day sober, when I can be very discerning, very insightful, very awake, I couldn't have picked the people that God put in my path. And they were these spiritual warriors who were showing up. And they told me about um, the neat thing about getting this work in the big book is it will ignite you. And everything will start to change, regardless if you're rich, poor, black, white. If externally nothing changes, your insides will change. But the thing we, I had to be careful for, they warned me, my elders warned me, about the reemergence of ego. And um, I, I have an article here, but I'm, I'm not even going to, I'm not getting moved to read it, so I'm going to leave it. But uh, Harry Tebow, uh, one of uh, the folks who helped AA so much, a non-alcoholic psychiatrist, was a guy who blew the doors open for us to expand into treatment centers, into detoxes, into hospitals. He was so credible. And one of his patients, uh, two of his patients actually, one in particular, who could not get sober. He threw everything possible at this guy, and the guy kept drinking. And out of desperation, he sent him to AA, and the guy came back sober, and he was made new. And that was a convincer for him. He saw the walk. His, uh, his walk became his talk, if you will. And uh, he went to his uh, uh, other doctors and, 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 and medical folks and listened. These guys in AA got something that we don't have. And what Harry Tebow goes on to talk about in a lot of his writings is this thing called reemergence of ego, where the ego will reconstruct. And the sad thing is, you don't know when it's happening. Everyone else sees it, but we can't see it. No matter how much we try to investigate ourselves, the self inquiry is, is futile because we can't see it. The ego disguises itself. And it looks like this um, the 11th step is out the window. I talk a good game, but I'm not really praying. I'm not reading any kind of scripture. I'm not reading the big book. I'm not reading anything, basically. I'm going to meetings and trying to sound profound. There is no such thing as a nightly review. In fact, I don't even know what that is anymore. Uh, meditation, that's for people who are Buddhists and monks. We don't do that in AA. That's a law. Okay. And so my amends list is not completed. I'm not doing a spot check during the day. And I talked about this last week, and we quickly go backwards through the steps. And I'm an untreated drunk. And what's really scary, if I'm around here a while, I know how to navigate around AA. I know when to drop some pearls of wisdom on some old information, old experience I had. People think I'm really got it together, and I really don't. I'm completely untreated. I'm lonely. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear. My ego is doing the thinking for me, doing the seeing for me, doing the speaking for me, being for me. But when I look in the mirror, I see gold. I see Moses, and everything's okay. I don't have a sponsor who could say, hey, what are you doing? What's, what's up with that? I'm accountable to me in my mind, so I'm in serious trouble. It's the reemergence of ego. Even though I've gone through the steps and experienced some of the depth of self, not complete depth of self, but some of the depth of self, defects of character, they, they can go to sleep for a while. They go dormant. God's the only power that can remove defects for his purpose. And my job is to surrender to this power. But if I get untreated, those defects start to work, wake up, and they bring their friends in. It's freezing in here, by the way. I don't know. It's really cold in here. <laughs> oh, smokes. I'm talking and shivering at the same time. I bet you the desert wasn't this cold. They didn't do the walk through Maine in December. Um, where was I? I was getting drunk. Um, <laughs> defects of character. They may go dormant for a while. As I become untreated, they start to wake up and they bring other defects in. And then we start to try to work on our defects, which is futile as well, because lack of power is my dilemma. I can't work on defects. But if I'm around here a little while, my ego uh, knows how to do AA, knows how to speak, knows how to act around other AAs. And that is probably more dangerous, I've watched this happen, than a newcomer who comes in and screws up. Because the ego isn't that bad yet where they'll just tell you, I'm not doing good, I'm thinking about using. They can, a newcomer can be more honest than someone who's around here 15, 20, 30 years but someone who's around 15, 20 years, 30 years, who's been through the big book, Alcohol's Anonymous, five years, who's been through the big book, the, a, the ego has reemerged, and they become dangerous to themselves and others. 
You start to have problems with pride and idolatry and worship people and worship other things quickly, forgetting that every eight member has clay feet. There's only one one power that's pure, one power that's not clay feet, one power that's pristine, consistent, and constant, and that's God. But how can I how can I seek God? How can I pray to God when my ego convinces me I am God? All my sponsees have to do everything I tell them to do, and I will give a great talk. But when I get home, my house looks like a drunk's house. I drive like a maniac drunk. I'm character assassinating people. I'm up in my head all day long talking and gossiping about people who I just had dinner with, who I just broke bread with, who I say, I'm your best friend. You need me. Give me a call and walk away. Oh, that guy's crazy. And the dialogue in the head is, cons- is, is, is constant. And we pay attention to a lot of voices. That's not an awakened being. That's an untreated alcoholic. Now, civilians have the same problem. But my problem is when that stuff goes on, I will drink eventually over that. But when the ego reemerges, it convinces me, oh, I will never drink. When a drunk tells me I will never drink, they're closer to a drink than they think. Because as alcoholics in step one, we drink. We drink. And the ego will find a reason to get some medicine, to wash the night away, to justify it. And it won't only come uh, uh, with thunderbolts when things bad happen, or what we interpret as bad. They will come when we have a winning Powerball ticket, when she or he says, I love you, when the baby is born. The ego will say, well, let's go celebrate. Look at you. Everything's right. All the ducks are in a row. Reemergence of ego. And no one's immune to that, me included. There was a time in, in, in on this journey, I was sober about uh, eight years or so, and uh, some of us get into being uh, like evangelic from the podium. And um, what's worse is we start to tell people you're wrong and I'm right. We start to criticize and character assassinate the folks who aren't in this big book, the folks who aren't doing what you're doing. And rather than being a powerful example, we become a uh, horrors of example. And I went, became a little self-righteous. But thank God for uh, sponsorship. Uh, I shared at a meeting one time, step six and seven. I wasn't behind the podium. I was sharing from the floor. And I was in that place. And the ego had uh, taken over. And after I shared an old time, Eddie, Eddie B., I think his name was, he looked over at me and he pointed at me like, like this. And he motioned to my sponsor. And after the meeting, we went outside and everyone was smoking a cigarette. Eddie went up to my sponsors. Did you talk to him yet? So I didn't. I thought he was going to say, speak for my anniversary. You're so profound, Peter. (laughs) Now, my first sponsor wasn't pretty with the language. He just about had a high school education. And uh, he had no problem dropping F-bombs all over me. And uh, he read me to write about some of the comments I made from the floor. I alienated myself, I separated myself from everyone else, and I was pointing fingers, and I didn't even know it. I didn't even see it, I didn't even hear it, and the ego was put back together again that quickly. Why that happens, I don't know. How it happens, I can tell you, it's when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. But some of us are doing all the work, and the ego still reconstructs itself. This is why sponsorship is so vital. Accountability to one person, at least, is so vital. And those of us who think we don't need a sponsor, we're ahead of a serious, serious trouble. Perhaps not tonight, maybe not in six months, not a year from now, but we're ahead of a trouble. Bill Wilson was accountable to Father Dowling. Bill Wilson was accountable while Ebby was sober. Dr. Bob was accountable to people. Our friendly members had sponsors. Chuck Chamberlain, Clarence Senate, they were accountable with people. These guys were giants in AA, but they were accountable with someone. I come along, I need to be accountable. All great spiritual teachers spoke to someone about stuff they weren't sure about, the inner workings of the mind, the disease and discomfort we have. As an alcoholic, I've talked about this many times, I'm flawed. The equipment's broke. My mind, um, my sponsor, you're on a horse riding backwards. You're never going to ride forward. It just doesn't work like other people. I will make a major drama out of a broken shoelace and blame someone for it. And then justify my anger. That's not same rational thinking. So I need to talk to someone about the broken shoelace or about my fear of fill in the blank. So they can kind of navigate me and get me right. And sometimes they need to be aggressive with us. And sometimes they just we just need a hug. I mean, we, we got your back, it's okay. More often than not, I responded to the bulldogs in AA. 
that's why when I, some of the people I sponsor, and even in my workplace, I can be pretty rough because it worked for me, and I can't share outside my experience. And then there's a time to put your arm around someone and say, I got your back, it's okay. All of this stuff leads up to step 11. It isn't about just practicing mechanics. Many folks know mechanics, know this big book better than I do, better than many. I don't want to have a cup of tea with them. Because they know they're mechanics specialists, they're big book lawyers. But what the book ought to do, like any religious or uh, spiritual piece of literature, is that information needs to become internalized. So I am the book. It's who I be now. So I may not dot every I and cross every T, but I'm a direct reflection of this power called God. I'm a direct reflection of this book. I'm a direct reflection of any religious or spiritual piece of information. I don't need to remember to be kind and loving and tolerant and patient. It's what God gave me at birth, and that's who I am. But knowing I'm going to fall short from time to time. I'm going to make the mistake. I'm going to be intolerant. I'm going to criticize because I'm broken. That's not a cop-out. That's just the way it is. But when I have a great God, a forgiving God, a merciful God, that I can go and say, I screwed up today. I was a little unkind to Joe. We'll go make amends and fix it. Am I in the willingness of forgiving others? I I don't know about you, but for me, when I go to God or I come to you and say, forgive me for what I've done, I want to be right now forgiven immediately. I mean, no waiting. Yet, when people come to us for an amends or forgiveness, we're going to think about it. Let them suffer just a little bit. I'll get back to you. That's just arrogance. I'm just wondering, and I don't want to break a tradition, what the planet would look like if people really practice love and forgiveness. What this planet would look like. And how much less character assassination we would have of people of different colors, different religions, different backgrounds. It goes on and on and on. And bury the hatch and let's get on with our life, huh? We do that in AA too. We become warring theologians. Right in AA, that guy is not in the big book. Don't talk to him. That guy's in the book. Big book. Keep him out. Don't ask him to speak. We do it in AA. There's a great expression, charity starts at home, love starts in AA, because then I can take it out there. And I can be tolerant of the intolerant ones. I can be forgiving of the non-forgiving ones, and there's a lot of them. This is like the school where we get something. We are fed in AA, and my job is now to take that and feed other people because out there is out there. It's insane out there. So what I need to do is get my GPS in here, my my God center in here, not me centered. So once I leave here, we're kind and loving for the most part, and we lean on each other. What happens when I leave this meeting tonight? What happens when I'm in public or on 95 or wherever I am? When people break your hearts, they disappoint you, or just hate you for who you are. How do we navigate through that? I mean, all you have to do is watch CNN for 10 minutes and say, the planet's crazy. It's insane. How am I going to deal with this? Because I'm part of that. We all are. How do we do that? Step 11 has fed me over and over and over again to navigate to that, even with my shortcomings and falling short. Because at the end of the day, he's in charge. No one else. And so we seek, with the desperation for drowning man or woman, God's will, not my will. And fear comes when I try to inflict my will on God. God, listen, you got to give me this, because after all, look at me, I'm great. I've done so much work for you, now feed me. Give me this, let them do that. That's when I run into trouble. That's when any of us will run into trouble. Step 11 is purely about seeking God's will here. And the question I get often is, how do I know the difference between my will and God's will? Well, first thing is, I know what God's will is not. She needs a sponsor. She's new. I should go sponsor her. And the quiet voice says, no, you don't. Because there's motives. We know what God's will is not. Very often, God's will is usually an inspiration, intuitiveness, just a rightness in us. It's a movement, it's a rhythm to speak or say or do something, and sometimes nothing. And there's very little, if any, stress, anxiety, fear, covering my tracks, manipulation. There's none of that going on. It's pure. 
and it feels foreign because it's new, because I'm so used to being a liar, a cheat, and a thief. So I stepped into God's God realm of purity, honesty, and selfishness and love. This feels a little uncomfortable. Well, sure it does. I'm killing self and ego right now. Then it becomes a way of life, and our book talks about a way of living, a way of life, where the uncommon becomes common, common becomes uncommon. I can't go back to lying, cheating, and stealing anymore. It's way too painful. The results of step 11. I think I mentioned drinking twice so far, huh? Because by now the drink problem has been removed. Or any other substance. If I'm truly in this 10, 11, and 12. It's not about fighting a drink or a drug off. Or any of the other isms. Sex, food, money, whatever it is. That stuff's part of my alcoholism. If I've been thorough in this work and I've been in 10, 11, and 12 in the sunlight of the spirit, that stuff might come by like the clouds path, but I'm not hooking in and following it. The sky will chase the clouds around the planet. Clouds come in and they go. Same thing with thoughts, compulsions to do things. They just pass because I'm right with God. Now part of this 11th step is meditation. It's the first practice to go to go by the board with many of us, maybe not this room, but in general. I've been around long enough to hear the horror stories. Meditation is, you know, driving in my car, meditate. That's not meditate. In fact, if you're meditating while you're driving, let me know. I won't get on the road. <laughs> How do you meditate and drive? How do you pray and drive? Dialogue with God we should do all the time. Conscious contact, constant contact with God. Turn in in order to go out. I should be in dialogue with God all day long. I tell newcomers, pray to God. He likes the sound of strange voices, you know. <laughs> Praying in the car, that's not the 11th step. All the 11th step would have said, when you get in your car, do prayer meditation. It says on awakening. I don't think I'm in my car on awakening unless I'm homeless. <laughs> he got it. He's not even part of us. I was in Nebraska a few weeks. I told a joke. Ten minutes later, they left. A little slower. <laughs> on awakening. On awakening, which means on awakening. Now, here's what God did for me. And at the risk of sounding pretentious, my hunger for God is, was great from the get-go. I did not get that. And I was given some instructions. It fueled that. My hunger to know this God is great still. I like the effect produced by God. And what God did for me was early in recovery, I woke up one morning, and I didn't go, another day, why are you doing this to me? I opened my, never forget it, I opened my eyes and I said, thank you, God, for this day. Please keep me clean and sober today. And it was the first conscious contact with prayer, with God on awakening. I didn't do Facebook. I didn't go to make 12 pots of coffee, 14 cigarettes, and talk on the phone, and walk the dog, and then come back to and off I go. Spend two hours trying to get the suit and the shirt to match and five seconds with God. That's not giving attention to God. It should be the most important event of my day. For me, it is. On awakening, I go hit my mat. I have a, a little altar I created with a meditation mat, all my AA stuff and my saints and all my religious thing. I'm a Catholic. I got some of that stuff. I got things from other religions because God's God to me. Just different roads to get there. And then I'll go about my morning and I'll do my stuff. And usually around 8 o'clock, I'm hitting the mat one more time before I go out the door. Because the business I work in, you better be ready. <laughs> now, I'll talk to God on the way to work. In my car. Okay, God, here we go. But that's not real prayer like the 11th step was talking about. Some of us, the way we pray, it looks like this. You ever try to speak to someone about something important, and they have their phone, and they're doing this, and they're looking up every once in a while? Oh, really? You, 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 you're, you're dying? I'm sorry to hear that. Wait, what? You're going to the hospital? Wait, one second. Let me hit this. Did that ever happen to you? Do you want to strangle them, or what do you want to do? This is what we do with God. Dialogue with God is great, but prayer is a little different. It should be a sacred moment, a sacred event where nothing gets in the way. And sometimes we're fortunate enough to pray with somebody. Hold hands and pray. 
That's giving attention to God. Not while I'm doing 40 other things and just checking in with God while I'm driving in my car and I pray while I'm in the shower. That's just talking to God. That's not prayer, according to my book. Nowhere in Scripture that says, while you're in the shower, seek God. And then after I'm done with prayer, I, I do meditation. My meditation times have evolved over, 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 over the years. The first time I meditated was about two minutes, and it felt like I was meditating for two years. It was forever, because the mind, it's interesting, when we stop everything going to meditation, the mind keeps going. It's like stopping short with a bunch of packages on your front seat. The car stops, and the packages keep going. We go into meditation, the mind keeps going, and we realize how noisy we've been. You want to see, you want to, when we experience silence, we realize how noisy we've been. When we experience silence, we realize how much dialogue is going on, and it feels foreign and uncomfortable, and the mind says, enough of this, let's move on. But something happens when we kind of get into the groove, into the rhythm of meditation, we really depend upon it, and the sacred silence, something we can't create, we, that's where we come from. I can't create that which already exists. And when we start to practice the sacred silence of meditation, the reason why it feels so fulfilling and right and nourishing, because it's my natural, our natural state of beingness. Noise interrupts everything. Even me doing this talk tonight, I'm asked to do a talk, so I give a talk. But it'd be really cool if I, if I got quiet for a minute and we just got still and just listened to our breath but many of us would get incredibly uncomfortable because we're listening to the mind rather than God breathing through us. But after a while, we learn how to detach or unhook from this predator called the mind and just pay attention to the spirit in every one of us. It's interesting in AA, they tell me, and uh, uh, in my religious community, tell me how God's is forgiving God no matter what I've done. Court of law feels a little different about it. People will feel different about it. But this walk on earth is a quick stop. It's a, a vapor and we're out. There's another place and another being we need to be seeking. This is a quick stop here. And I'm going to spend this quick stop angry, resentful, fearful, warring, anger. It goes on and on and on. My sponsor, Mark, would tell us what he, he would tell me, what are you doing about the dash? I had no idea what he's talking about. I said, what is a dash? He's going to a, a graveyard. There's a headstone. The day God brought you here, a number. And the day God took you home, a number. In the middle is a two-inch dash. That was your life, two inches, two-inch dash, your entire life. Whether you're 40, 50, 100, boom, in and out. What are you going to do about it? And we have a tremendous opportunity in Alcoholics Anonymous. To really, when the time comes, say, wow, what a ride that was. No regrets. Did it right, and I'm leaving clean the way it came in. So I spent time in meditation. And the thing about meditation is the posture and breath. Every book I've studied talks about two things, among other things, two consistent things, posture and breath. And I go to some AA meetings, and I do, let's do a two-minute meditation, three-minute meditation. We do it in my home group. Two minutes. Two minutes. You can't even smoke a cigarette in two minutes. But we throw that out. And very often I watch. Not to take in. Well, I'm taking in. <laughs> I want to know my guys what their posture looks like. I want to know the guys I sponsor what their posture looks like. And I can read someone's struggle if you just watch people meditate. Legs crossed, arms folded. That's not a meditation posture. So I say either they weren't taught or they don't care. Books on the lap, things like that. It's not the way you meditate. In an ideal world, we would have very loose clothes on with no shoes, no sandals, hopefully no jeans, maybe just some light, loose clothes. The radio's not on. MTV's not on. I'm not listening to Snoop Dogg. I mean, there's nothing going on. It's quiet. And some of us need music and candles and incense. That's all nice. That's all good. But you don't need that to meditate. In fact, sometimes music, meditation, music, incense and candles, as nice as that is, can be a distraction for us to keep us from experiencing pure silence. Got meditation music, because I don't have to be silent. 
I know my candles are burning. I'm really focused on the candles rather than my mind. So it becomes actually a distraction. Can I meditate with nothing? Just me on a mat, and that's it. And just work with breath. So posture. Posture. Relaxed. Very often when newly meditating, the shoulders are up here. Because I'm tight. The world's on my back. I'm trying to keep it up. I'm tense. I'm fearful. I'm angry. But I'm going to be Moses for a half hour. And I've heard people get attached to the time in meditation. It becomes a contest. A spitting contest. I did 20. I did 25. I did 45. Every day I'm doing an hour. I'm up at 3 a.m. I'm up at 2 a.m. Time out. The book says God doesn't make two hard turns to those who seek him. So today might be a half hour. Maybe tomorrow he's sitting for 10 minutes and God says, hey, I need you here. The idea is I'm going in and in doing I succeed. But I give time in meditation every day to my God. I give a few minutes at night. And the other thing I've been moved to do, this is old now. It's, it's been a bunch of years. Uh, I got moved one day to go pray and meditate and work with the religious practice. Work with these beads that I have. I carry them all the time. And I just... It takes me 10 minutes to go through these beads. Not even to go through these beads. That's my prayer. A bunch of prayers involved in this. And then I just sit. I will do it in my car. Park my car somewhere. I'll go into a parking lot. I'll, I don't care. It's a 10-minute, 15-minute process at max in the middle of the day just to get centered, not to lose my home base. And then I go out again. And there's times when I'm incredibly tired. I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. I've got to get home, but I will still do that because I can't go without it. I need God's food. I need the nourishment. I need the soul food. So my book tells me this, that I shouldn't be shy in the matter of prayer. Better men than than me are using it constantly. So am I shy about talking about prayer in an AA meeting? Am I shy about talking about God in an AA meeting? Am I shy about talking about God outside of AA? Because God's not popular right now. This country's becoming secular. God's a bad word. It's popular to not God. Can I talk about God to those when I'm to other people? How important God is to me? Am I going to deny God? I want God here, but I'll deny him out there. I'm a hypocrite. Am I going to offer the word of God to people in AA or not? If not, I'm a hypocrite. i got to live with that, no one else. It says it works if I have the proper attitude to work out and work at it. What kind of attitude are they talking about? Honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. Simple. It would be easy to be vague about this matter, yet we believe we can make some definite valuable suggestions. When they wrote this book, they were just over a short time. Just a couple of paragraphs page and a half, maybe with 10, a couple of pages and 11, and yet is that powerful? They could have gone on for pages and pages and pages to the point they bulleted suggestions that we do. AA members have uh, uh, surrendered to this and if they just follow what step 11 says, they will have profound changes in our, we will have profound changes in our life. This, this utopia is certainly not out there, although we think it is in a paycheck and a new car and a relationship. Those are wonderful things. But the real inner piece of utopia is right in here. The big book says, I'm going to show you how to get in there. You ever hear the story about the, the uh, three guys who found the most precious gift in the world, happiness, and they wanted to hide it from man? One guy says, put it on a high mountain. They'll never find it. And the guy's not going to claim mountains. Another guy says, put it at the bottom of the ocean. They'll never find the guys. No, they'll learn how to find it. The third one says, well, five put happiness where man will never look for it. And that's inside of himself. And so we go to meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings, and we're still restless and discontented. The great reality is deep down within, my book says. It says, when I retire at night, I constructively review my day. This isn't about beating me up. Let's take a look. Let's build off of the mistakes we made today. Where was I resentful, selfish, dishonest, and afraid? They assume I was, because they know me. Do we owe an apology to someone? Have I kept something to myself which should be discussed with another person? Was this is the one we get in trouble? This is sins of omission. I can't tell anyone about that. Why not? Because my ego won't let me. 
This is why we have sponsors. If there's a name for it, it's already been done. Probably better. Was I kind and loving toward all? What could I have done better? Was I thinking of myself most of the time? Alcoholics, that's what we do. We think of ourselves all the time. Let's not talk about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? I mean, that's how we operate. Right? Was I thinking of what I can do for others, of what I could pack into the stream of life? So I take this inventory. Then my book gives me a warning not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection. And if I do too long, what happens is my ego's in the way. I can't believe I made a mistake today. Oh, my God. That's all ego. They put erasers on pencils because they knew I was going to school. I'm going to make mistakes. That's why we got God. What it says to do, if I drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, I stay there too long, I'm supposed to be an effective agent for God. If I do that, my book says, I diminish my usefulness to others, which is why got me, God got me sober. Not so I can own stuff. God got me sober to save my life and now use me to get someone else. But if I'm consumed with me and all of my stuff again, that's what newcomers do. And we expect it. But we got this big book. We got God. Okay, screwed up. Ah, got to fix it. Go fix it. Keep moving. Keep moving. Keep riding. Because if I'm not pursuing God, my illness is pursuing me. And that's all it needs is for me to sit back and say, oh, my God, I screwed up. I can't believe it. All these years so sober. Um, I was late on my IRS tax returns. It's the end of the world. I can't believe I did this. Oh, my God. I'm going right to hell for this one. It's really okay. It's really okay. That's why they have extensions. That's why we invented the word forgive, because I screwed up. Can you forgive me? What do I do when I wake up? Wake up late, run out the door with a cup of coffee in my hand. Okay, God, I got you. Okay, we're going to go with that. And you got yesterday on you. Weren't too good Monday, Tuesday, you got a hangover from Monday, and your day's not right. And you're looking for something to, to get right. So you gotta, you got to take time off to run to a meeting just to get right. That's bondage. i got to get there rather than I get to go. Spiritual muscle is about now. I love the words I get to. I get to work with. I get to do it. I get to pray. I get to meditate. I get to see God. Where else would I want to be? In God's presence. And I get to do that in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. And then I get to walk with God all day long. And if I'm right in here, no matter how twisted up somebody is, I know deep down in there is their great reality, their God. So I can cut through all the insanity, not take what they're doing personally. And somewhere in there is just as much God in them as me. And when I criticize and condemn you, I'm telling God, you screwed up. Like I'm a God bigger than God. And people will annoy us. People will, will it, it, get us angry. Okay, what are we going to do about it? Forgive them for they know not what they do, is what one man said. I love the quote before. How's it go? Before I take the speck out of your eye, let me take the beam out of mine. Welcome to the NFL. On awakening, I think about the 24 hours ahead. I consider my plans for the day. Then it says, hold on, before you do anything, because in about five minutes an alcoholic's going to take over this day, what do we do? We go to the boss. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking. Because the book knows once the thinking turns the engine on, that's it. Look out. My sponsor is sober 40 years. And he wakes up. And he says, God, before this alcoholic starts his day, please take over right now. Because he knows what he's capable of doing. It may not be that bad that day, but eventually, we don't pray Monday, we don't pray Tuesday, we don't pray Wednesday, check in Thursday, maybe a little check in Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and suddenly we're off the chain and we're hurting people. I'm infecting other people. So on awakening, let's think about the 24 hours a day uh, ahead. I consider my plans for the day. Before I begin, I ask God, I go to the boss, let him direct my thinking. Especially ask that, asking that it be divorced from self-pity, dishonest, and self-seeking motives. That's alcohol. It's untreated alcoholism. A little lie here and there ain't going to hurt anyone. Really? How do I know? It's killing me. But my ego says, 
You got Teflon. You're Teflon down. You're good. You can lie all you want. They can't lie. Isn't it funny how we can lie, but you lie to me? I'm not talking to you forever. Right? My sponsor says if I lie in this area of my life, I am a liar. Tomorrow's April 15th. That's rigorous honesty tomorrow night. <laughs> Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with, with assurance. For after all, God gave me a brain to use. Watch this. My thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when my thinking is cleared of wrong motives. Thinking, thoughts. Thoughts and thinking. So it's not like I, I, I stop thinking, but it's being uh, uh, directed by God. I can be uh, better at telling God's will and my will. God gave me a brain to use. I can make plans. I can consider my plans for the day. I'm starting to think a renewal of this mind through this metanoia, this purging, this emptying out of me, the death of self, the successful living. So now this brain that God gave me works, and this mind is no longer my master. God gives me intuitiveness, thoughtfulness, consideration, open-mindedness, willingness, love, charity, impeccable with my word, things like that. And suddenly, I'm moving through the day. Make a mistake, I make amends, keep moving. Learn from it. What could I have done better? It tells me at night. It may seem like a lot of work at the beginning. It really isn't when it becomes a way of living. But if you think about how we're living, even in AA, untreated, compared to following a few simple instructions that will become internalized, we well, don't need to remember to be kind and loving. It's who we be. This is like kissing a newborn on the cheek compared to the way we're living, untreated in AA, when we're not drinking. And when I'm acting out in any way, that's my drink. I need relief. I need something other than God right now to make me feel okay. Here comes the drink. Here comes the drug. Here comes the acting out sexually, food, money, whatever. I need something because I'm diseased. Again, I'm in a place of disease and discomfort. I don't have to do is turn back to God, but some of us have to bottom out. Some of us will drink and some of us will die, until, and that's where we'll find ease and comfort. That's where we'll finally get some freedom when we die. And we'll go out on a drink or an overdose or whatever it might be. That's what we do. That's what I do. It tells me I may not be able to determine which course to take. What do I do? Back to God. Ask God for inspiration, intuitive thought or a decision. God, what do I do? God, what do I do? God, what do I do? Then I can turn to my sponsors. Listen, I'm struggling with this. What do you think I should do? Yes, seek counsel. You know, how's the car running? Consistency, accountability, responsibility, CAR. How am I doing with that? Consistently calling my sponsor. Accountable to my sponsor, maybe a small group, group of folks. Responsible. I show up for my phone calls. I show up for my meetings. I show up when I'm supposed to. I'm not running the show. In fact, my life is none of my business. It's God's business, and it's taking pretty good care of it. I'm not going to screw with this. Although my mind says, you know, you can, you can do a little bit on your own. But, I, you know, let my walk be my talk because Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock, I'm on the phone. Every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, I'm on the phone with my sponsor. And sometimes I'm asked to do workshops on Wednesday, and I go to my sponsor and say, listen, I got asked to do 12 weeks on a Wednesday. He says, that's going to interrupt us for three months. Can you pass? I say, okay. I call the next. I can't do it. Some folks say, what do you mean? After all these years of sobriety, that's right. He's my teacher. When did I get bigger than my teacher? I'm the student. Even when I sponsor, I still approach that as a student with a beginner's mind. I teach, but always as a student. Sometimes I can learn from someone with 30, 40 days. If I think I can't, boy, do I got an ego problem. My God entrusted a handful of folks who were newbies to carry a message. They weren't carrying a message for years. And he says, I'm going to turn it over to you. My God got a bunch of roughnecks who were new and said, go. How willing are we? 
to find God, to experience God? How willing am I to get well if I'm sober a while? What does my 11-step currently look like? Do I have an 11-step practice? If I'm making you uncomfortable from the bottom of my heart, that's not my intent. But if I'm making you uncomfortable because you don't have an 11-step practice and the ego is getting really, really squirrely. If you have an 11-step practice and someone talks about it, you say, that's different. I never heard that. I wonder what I can do. Maybe I can do more. That's good. Taking notes. I want to learn. Not from me, from anyone. But if I'm getting really uncomfortable about now after this talk, and I can't wait for this talk to end, it's because I'm not doing anything. <laughs> and I just ripped the covers off the ball. <laughs> Uh-oh. Okay, we got to close. We got to close? <laughs> James broke into a cold sweat. <laughs> okay, a couple more things. As we go through the day, this is where we're, this is our day now. Now, step 10 is about walking around. 11 is getting us up and ready. So it's kind of like they bleed into each other. Okay, But 11 specifically, prayer, meditation, what to do during my day, and now I'm in my day, and step 10 tells me certain things to do. But it says in step 11, as I go through my day, I pause when? Agitated or doubtful. So the book assumes I may get a little agitated or doubtful from time to time. Pause is a comma, which means a minute, a beat, maybe a while. Pause. Hold on a second. What do I do? It tells me I go back to God. I ask for the right direction. God, I, I don't know what to do here. Call up the sponsor. Maybe some support friends and say, listen, I, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm a little rudderless right now. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. That's being teachable. That's humility at work. It says I constantly remind myself I'm no longer running the show. Humbly say to myself, each day, thy will not mine be done. That's a prayer I work with. Father, your will not mine be done. Show me what relationships to have and how to have them. Remove the hypocrisy from me. Keep my soul from being poisoned. Let me be an effective agent for you. Your will, not mine, be done. Even when I'm looking at some uncomfortable things, financial stuff, maybe health stuff, maybe job uncertainty. And so I go to God. Let me carry out your will. Your will, not mine, be done. Here's what I found out. Many, many times in my life, uh, sober. Uh, there were things where I wish God would just pay a little close attention and read my script. Because <laughs> I'm going to be rich and successful tomorrow. And if he would just put his blessings on it, I don't have to work anymore. In fact, the IRS won't even ask me for tax money anymore. It isn't any good. And God has some other plans. And I start to say God's not paying attention. And maybe I start to have doubt and skepticism about this God. After all, I've done some great work. Where's my reward? I'm in a little trouble. And sometimes when I think my will isn't being fought out and God's not paying attention to me, he's keeping me out of trouble. And so I get frustrated and I argue with God and I debate with God and God's going to do what God's going to do. Fast forward. Three months, six months, nine months, where everything lands right. And I go, it's a good thing I didn't get what I wanted. It's a good thing God wasn't paying attention to my insanity because we look back and say, what were you thinking? And I shared this story very often. I'll close with this. Uh, It's going on four years uh, now. About uh, I was working in Texas, breaking my my back for this company, giving them my, my blood. And they dropped me like a bad habit. And greed was their motivator. And I'm out of work, and I'm wondering, God, there were about 40 men who came through my doors who were chronic relapse, who were sober now. You took care of them. You made me help them. What's the deal? How could you just, like, say, that's it, you're unemployed? And where am I going to get hired at my age? But God had a plan in mind. So I did some work there. The work there was complete. I couldn't see this. Then he picks me up and puts me in South Florida and going to work for a place that I adore working for, doing what I love to do, and then putting certain people in my life. I look back and say, great. It was a great thing I got let go in Texas. I would still be stuck in Texas. (laughs) Near Brownsville. But, I mean, look where I live, look where I work. So it's always darkest before dawn. So I've learned the hard way. Let go. And let God. We use that a lot in AA, but we don't know what it means. Let go. Just let God do the driving. Let me be a willing passenger. And all I do is suit up and show up and serve others. Serve, serve, 
That's what we do in AA. Love and service. That's all I got. Peace. I'm Peter. I'm a very spiritual speaker. <laughs> and, I'm hu- and I'm humble. <laughs> Let's get that out Okay. Um, Peter, recovered alcoholic. Yeah. I'm grateful to be here and uh, get to share a little bit more on uh, step 11 tonight and, uh, and see where God takes me. I'm usually totally unprepared for these things uh, before I come speak. Uh, my preparation is yesterday and today and last week and the week before that. And I try to be, uh, my sponsor would call it a hollow bone, an empty vessel to go do these things and have no interference um, to go speak. Uh, part of my 11th step, and I take that into when I get to do these things, is uh, a fasting. Those that are close to me know I usually fast at least four hours before I get to a podium, sometimes longer. Um, I drink very little. Maybe I cheat with a cup of coffee before I speak just to get the heart going and get a pulse. But um, uh, I'm very strict with that. And uh, very often I would uh, observe uh, silence around the house. Uh, I don't watch a lot of television. I don't listen to a lot of radio. Um, and sometimes observe a fast. Uh, and it was a time when uh, every couple of weeks I would observe a fast on Saturdays uh, from the time I woke up uh, till I went to bed at night. The only thing I would do uh, is have some fruit. Uh, so the sugar would maintain a, a healthy level, otherwise I'd probably collapse with the way my sugar operates. But uh, that would be it in water. And um, I, it was a cleansing uh, for me and a purification uh, that I work with. So when I get to do these things, um, I'm usually real quiet. I fast. I don't really get into a lot of uh, talking and caught up in a lot of stuff. And it seems to keep my center um, not only to do this, but just in general. Uh, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988. And I get to talk about being recovered. Um, with the 11 step, there's someone who's, uh, I read a lot about her and she's a hero. And I, I've done this before here. I just want to share again. And she says the following. It says, people are often uh, unreasonable and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are honest, people may cheat you. Be honest anyway. You find happiness, people uh, may be jealous Be happy anyway. The good you do today may be forgotten tomorrow. Do good. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. For you see, in the end, it is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. And this is a woman who dedicated her life to poverty and helping others. And she had that spirit and changed lives. Uh, And what she says at the end is between us and God, not us and the masses. Never play to the crowd. Never try to get approval from other people because we will always be disappointed. Everyone has clay feet and some are sicker than others. And so we try to keep our center, center being God, God-centered rather than self-centered, God-reliant rather than being self-reliant. And people may bruise our feelings so from time to time. We'll get pushed around and knocked back and we'll wonder what was that all about. But if my, <clears throat> my center is God and I'm clear, so I can hear. Um, I will get back on, on the horse and keep riding and learn to forgive them. The great quote that I love is, forgive them for they know not what they do. Um, so to share with you how that comes into my life, and, and part of the 11th step isn't just in the morning upon awakening praying, and then do a meditation, and then running out the door and say, okay, world, here I come, and then walk into a meeting at night and pretend we're Moses and uh, maybe do a little spot check during the day with step 10 and then get home at night and do some inventory, prayer meditation, go to bed. And really during the day, nothing was accomplished. Part of the 11th step is on awakening to take that, get centered with prayer meditation is what I do. Uh, and the words just are conveying a thought. Our words in any language, English language, really don't uh, uh, convey what we're trying to say. When we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father, I mean, it's just two words, but what, it, the, what we're praying to transcends the words. And each one of us, our Father, has a different meaning. My sponsor had me meditate on the words, our Father, for six months. I was working with Sermon on the Mount. And he goes on to explain and breaks down the prayer. And my job, my assignment was for the next six months, when you go into meditation, meditate on those two words, our Father. What does that mean? And you get to see how those two words, but the feeling behind it transcends the language. 
So when I pray in the morning, I'm offering thoughts, I'm offering uh, uh, ideas, I'm, I'm, I'm seeking uh, uh, freedom, I'm throwing myself at the mercy of God, but really what's behind the words is what counts. And more important is when I get up off my knees and I go out there. How's my 11th step then? Because most folks don't care I go to AA. Most folks don't care anything about what I do. Most folks have their own agenda, their self-interest, and their egos at play. How am I going to get through that? So uh, I had a, a fabulous Thursday uh, through the holidays, fabulous Friday, uh, incredible Saturday at, at services, and, and yesterday was a very important holiday for me, and I was able to sit on two services, and I got to spend a day with my dad, his wife, Mary, Marion and some friends, and we had a blast. And uh, so I came into work this morning, and at around 9:02, um, it it just went nuts at work. And um, it's really interesting how um, how hurtful someone you're close to when they say unkind things can be, how they pierce. And so at around 10 after 9, um, there was an altercation, and someone was coming right at me. I mean, just just right at me, and, and false accusations, and I was taken back because this person is so close to me. Now, what am I going to do with that? So it's a work environment, and I need to maintain integrity at work and protect my staff and some other things, so I have to draw a little line in the sand. And uh, now what? Do I go to the day uh, assassinating this person's character because they hurt my feelings? You know, they upset my serenity. And um, what, what do I do with that? Well, here's the neat thing. I didn't have to remember to be forgiven. I didn't have to remember to practice love and tolerance. I didn't have to remember to pray for them. It's who I be. And when things like that happen, it's a real good idea. You get a real good barometer check as to where we are in the spiritual path. Because people are going to do things that hurt us. We live in a world of impermanence and things, things are going to leave. So what I did around 9.30, I had uh, stopped by uh, uh, this woman's program that I'm in charge of, and I got my car, and I wrote some inventory, and I made some prayer. It was a prayer of forgiveness for those people who hurt me. And I had a great morning. I had a great day at work. It was actually very productive. And that's where it is, and I'll continue to pray for this person. Now, I didn't invent that, and I didn't have to remind myself of that. And I thought, well, I'm a spiritual person because... James said so, so I have to really practice these principles. It's really what, how God has made me. So how am I doing when I'm going through the day, after getting up off my knees and praying, however, however we pray, and I'm out there, and the world isn't kind? Or maybe I'm reading some headlines in the news that I'm really, really uh, uh, getting angry about. Or people are not just doing what I want to do. I quickly see <clears throat> how I'm playing God, how, how I'm the director, how this person was supposed to act to me on a Monday morning, and they weren't following my script. They weren't owning when I walked in the office. And I got to see someone who's sick and untreated who I, who I adore, and I would do anything to help them. But I can't get in the way of their, their bottom either. And so I got back on the horse, and I worked with this stuff. And when I came home earlier, um, I got some quiet time and some meditation time. And my prayers and meditation were not for me today. It was for this other person. So I'm here to speak tonight and free of that this morning. That was a long time ago. That was maybe eight, nine hours ago. So I'm not up here talking but still wearing a resentment that happened at 9 o'clock, which a lot of us do. We walk at resentments for days and weeks and months and years, and that will infect everything we do. So how am I doing part of the 11th step when we're talking about walking, walking the spiritual path, living a spiritual life? Part of it is forgiveness. The interesting thing about forgiveness is when I forgive you for things you've hurt me with, I get free. First, I let you off the hook. Lord knows when I go to God for forgiveness, or I come to you for forgiveness, I want to be forgiven now. As if it never happened. So can I do that with other people when they do wrongs towards me or even towards others? So part of this 11th step has a lot to do with forgiveness. God, I go to God often and forgive me. I had bad thoughts about someone. How could I make it right? Part of my life is forgiveness. And in forgiveness, there's a tremendous amount of healing that takes place. I actually did studies on this. That when I forgive someone for something they've done to me, something gets released in the brain. It's just, I don't know much about it, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a healing that goes on. They documented this stuff. 
And I remember years ago, there were the L.A. riots with this guy, Rodney King, and there were a bunch of guys who pulled a truck driver out of the truck, and they hit him over the head with a cinder block. They almost killed him. And on national TV, they were all together, and he forgave them. The Pope, uh, who's passed on, the last Pope, we, uh, two Popes ago, he forgave this person who tried to shoot him and kill him. And most civilians would say, well, that's crazy. No, it isn't. When we're living along the lines of human consciousness, it's crazy. It's bizarre. Why would I forgive these people? When we're in the lo- living along the lines of God consciousness, it makes perfect sense. You can't live without doing that. And what happens is I get free of what happened and the healing begins. Now here's what the problem is. The ego's involved in all of this. Now I love my wounds, I love my hurts, I love my drama, I love my story. It's part of me, it's part of my life, it's part of what I come at you with. And the very frightening thing is when they say, Pete, we know you've been hurt, we know you've been wounded, we know you've been violated. Can you heal that and move on and leave it there? After the work is done with God and 12 steps and perhaps outside help like therapy, can you leave it there or are you going to walk around with it? And it looks like this. People will come up to you and say, how you doing? I'm, you know, hanging in there. First of all, that's a bad one. Hanging in there. Hanging in there. Ha- I'm hanging in. No, I'm, I'm hanging in. And then they'll ask you, so what's going on? Well, I'm working through something. We're always working through something. Well, they'll ask you a simple question, a yes or no answer, and we give them four hours of our drama, our entire life. Or we'll get upset when someone challenges us on past hurts. When are you going to work through this? Isn't it time you move on now? You've been in your fourth step forever. How about letting this stuff go? And we, we, take, we get taken aback by that. We become defensive with that. How dare you strip me of my wounds and my sword? That's my story. And the problem is we never heal. It's more frightening to get free of that and go out there and live life on God's terms than to sit with this stuff. We'd rather sit in our old wounds, whether, I don't care what the wounds are, there's a time and place in this process that we have to put it to bed, heal it, and move on. Because if we don't, my experience has been, in my living now, I'm still listening to voices of the past. I'm never free. And if I don't get free in my past, how could I be present now? How could I be effective agent? How could I really experience God when those things from the past are really my God? I pay homage to my hurts. I pay homage to my wounds. They're the most important thing. This is me. There's a great exercise that this, uh, this one author talks about in this book. He says, the practice of no name. And what he does, he gives this example of my name is, is Peter Marinelli, Italian-American from New York. My family's this. I have my wounds. I have my hurts. I have my family, the social mores. I grew up all this stuff. And you put it in this big basket. That's me. All the heartbreaks, all the disappointments, all the resentments, all my stuff. That's my story. I throw it over my back, and I go through life with it. That's my story. My family's crazy, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and it goes on and on and on. Just ask me, I will gladly tell you of all my hurts. And that becomes our identification as to who we be. No, those are things that have happened to us. At one point, there's a book that came out called Drop the Rock. At one point, am I going to like, enough? And we won't do that, I won't do that, because stepping out into the world raw without my story is awfully scary. And what <clears throat> this author talks about, and it takes some work, <clears throat> can you give me that drink, please? I need a drink to do this. Huh? Thank you. What he talks about doing is going into meditation <clears throat> with no name. And what he means by that is, we stop putting our stuff in this basket. We put a lid on it. And I go into meditation, and I have no name. You know my name is Peter Marinelli. No name. I have no family. My, my heritage is in Italian. I'm not an American. Nothing. Purely spirit. Now, that takes some work, and it's a focus. And at the beginning, it was felt very awkward and weird and like, what is this all about? And at one point, after working with this for weeks and weeks, it clicked. And in meditation, it was just spirit. All the Peter Marinelli means certain things. 
185 from Brooklyn, recovering alcoholic, seven treatment centers, homeless, violated, abused. It goes on, dump all, it was no more. Those are things that have happened to me. It doesn't determine who I be anymore. How could it? But yet my mind wants to wrap its arms around all of that and say, this is my story, and we never, ever get free for an AA 50 years. We go to therapy for 50, we can pray and meditate till the cows come home. I'm not letting go of the past. Now, you can't just let go of it. There's some work we need to do with, with the steps, and some of us need outside help. But I wasn't putting anything else in a basket. And I sat in meditation, just spirit, just spirit, with breath. I have no origin, if that makes sense. And at some point, it clicked. And the feeling was euphoric and freeing. And I got to step back and look at my life as it was, no longer is. Does that make sense? That's what happened to me. And I got to see for the first time <clears throat> my parents' wounds. I got to see people who hurt me, their wounds, and the, the cycle that they were in, the tornado they were caught up in. What do I expect people to do when they're living that kind of life? Into their own stuff. And it's tough to admit that even our parents, who we know love us, can be very selfish and self-centered and self-seeking. <clears throat> Most of the planet's that way. Oh, not my parents. Your parents, not mine. No, they were. And they didn't mean to hurt, but they did. <clears throat> I got to step back and see I'm a direct extension of this power called God, that there was no separation between me and God, a physical extension of that power which can't be seen, but certainly experienced. It was an incredible thing that went on for me, kind of playing with this 11th step and work with new meditation practices. Am I willing to let go of the hurts from the past? How could I be present if I'm driven by voices of the past? And a lot of it begins with the spirit of forgiveness for, towards others. There were people, I had a, uh, there was a, uh, someone, a distant relative, who did bad things to me when I was a kid. And I had to pray for the willingness to forgive this person, because I wasn't up to the plate yet, okay, I'm ready to forgive. It was a long road for me to even get there, but I prayed for the willingness to forgive this person. Now, the thing about forgiveness doesn't mean that you and I are going to be best friends if I forgive you if you've hurt me. It just means I let myself free of that. Even let them get free uh, opportunity to heal. It doesn't mean we're going to hang out and break bread and we're going to be best friends and sing songs around the campfire. In fact, it, it, most often we'll never see each other again. I'm not going to deal with you anymore, but you're not going to hurt me either. But I get free in the spirit of forgiveness. And some of us have had some horrific things happen to us, and I don't want to minimize that at all. But the 11th step, we look at it, <clears throat> two sentences about, well, it's a few sentences in the 11th step, and we think that's it. And what the steps are, are just <clears throat> bullet points to do work behind. There's a lot behind each step. So, you know, sort through prayer meditation to approve our conscious contact with God as we understood and pray for the only knowledge of His will for the, and the power to carry it out. Okay, we're done. There's work and there's years of discipline. And where the 11th step can take us, we don't know. Because it's limitless. We're talking about the boss now. We're talking about having direct line to this power called God. And when I'm open to that, it means I can hear God and other people, including the man or woman one day just coming back. And if I'm able to do that, my ego has shut down for a little bit. Lots of practices in meditation. And a lot of times we don't talk about meditation in AA because some folks don't do it. So how can we talk about something we don't do? We'll share from the floor about oh, meditation is important. When you go to that person, what's your meditation life like? They don't have an answer because we don't do it. And you have a, 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 a group of folks in AA who hear meditation and literally meditating, they think that's an outside issue. It's Eastern philosophy. It is not. How silent do we get? How often do I touch the sacred silence? And I can't create that which already exists. It's already there. What I'm doing is stepping into something that's already there. It's always there. And my mind would tell me I need to create silence. I need to be still. There's no work involved if I just sit in posture and breath and be still. There's the silence. Where's the noise from? The head. <clears throat> and I got to see how much noise was going on in me when I tried to get silence for the first time and working in 11th step. 
What made it a lot easier for me was going through one through nine and clearing out self, killing off a whole bunch of self, taking a, a sledgehammer to the ego. was still there. The self was still there, but a lot less impact on me, and it freed me up a little bit to kind of stretch in step 11. So to really have an effect of 11 step, I need to do the work in 1 through 9, enter the world of the spirit. Work with the disciplines of step 10. Work with the disciplines of 11. It's growing and understanding and effectiveness. I don't graduate. And I need to be seeking, I still do it, need to be seeking counsel from other people. I think I heard God's voice, God told me to do this, and a sponsor say, that wasn't God, that was your ego. Or he might say, well, that sounds genuine, that sounds right, let's do it. But I need to seek counsel. And I can get into a lot, a lot of us can get into trouble if we don't have someone who's seeking counsel with the sponsor. A great event happened to me years ago. I was about nine years sober and working with prayer meditation and visiting my, my religious community and lighting these candles and, and with no expectation, just lighting candles, uh, uh, one for sick and suffering and one for my mom. And I was doing this right out of the starting gate of sobriety. And I looked back on it. That was God's hand touching me because what alcoholic and addict with about 30 days is interested in another alcoholic getting well? None of us are. It's all about us. But God had me get away from me and light for a candle for the sick and suffering and one for my mom, who had passed on. And I didn't know what was going on. I was just faithfully, every week, sometimes twice a week, I would go into my religious, into my church, light two candles, make prayer, and go. And then when the ground was fertile enough, God delivered something, a banquet to me, soul food. That completely changed my life forever. I think I shared last week, experiencing God is like death and falling in love. It's unexpected and unprecedented when it happens. Just boom, there it is. And when God shows up, God shows up. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But when that power touches you, whether it's in an event or just sitting all alone, but when God touches you, you know it. It's profound. It's mood altering. It's life changing. It's a complete reversal in everything. Common sense becomes uncommon sense. My views about life, my perceptions about life, even my language changes. And part, the byproduct of that is I'm willing to forgive people. And my ego has gotten a little bit quiet. Oh, it's still there. I don't know when the ego will ever go away. I don't know if self will ever go away completely, probably when he calls me home. But from day one to day, almost 26 years later, how much ego is involved in my life? You be the judge of that. I like to think it's shut down a little bit. You be the judge of that. How much self is involved? You be the judge of that. I just know my days are not full of drama and headaches and tension. Oh, there's things that show up that get me sometimes, and I'll wrestle. You know how we wrestle with stuff. I'll figure this out. We all like to figure stuff out. And then the quiet voice goes, what are you doing? Why are you fighting again? The book says we cease fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Alcohol is an afterthought. How am I doing with my life? What am I wrestling with? Finances, relationships, uh, workers, what, what's that look like? How much drama, how much, how much stuff am I torn up in? How much power am I giving to people other than God? Yet I'm claiming God at an AA meeting. Oh, I love God, God's everything. And someone pisses me off and they own me for the next six hours. Well, where's God? Oh, so I'm a liar. That's what my sponsor would tell me. Oh, so you're a liar. You just talked about God, but Joe got you angry. You're obsessed with Joe, so I guess he's God. So you're a liar. Whether I'm working or playing, it should all look the same, huh? If I'm really living this spiritual path, if I'm really walking this walk. The other thing that's happened to me with step 11, uh, uh, there was a time in my sobriety where um, I would pay attention. I was big into Eastern philosophy. I still am. And I'm a Catholic and it was Catholicism. Even Christianity. Any other religion, well, that's something else. Not pay too much attention, not, not too credible. And um, I thought I had, you know, the, the, the good stuff. And my sponsor took me through the work, and we attacked a couple of those things, and I got to take my inventory and a lot of these little bullet points that were asleep. And what I came out with was 
uh, an incredible uh, uh, feeling of open-mindedness <clears throat> to all religions, all walks of life, all ideas, therapeutic community, the shrink community, all of it. And I looked at it like what an abundance of information that I can wrap my arms around, digest and be transformed and be a better agent for God. Prior to that, there were a couple of deadbolts on the doors. So although I thought I was experiencing freedom, and I was, I wasn't free. So the question we ask, how free do we want to be? And if we're sitting in the AA meeting, aside the fact that if you're new, but if we're sitting in AA meeting, we're around here a little while, and we're not experiencing freedom, why? Why is that? Another part of the 11 step that I was able to work through, and please understand, this, I didn't do this on my own. I had great teachers with me, great sponsors, a great support group. And the men who came before me, my elders, were really into 10 and 11. I've been blessed that way on this path. But there's something that uh, this, this gentleman talks about. Um, they kind of hit on it with, uh, um, in our book of, with resentments and fears. Um, <clears throat> one of the things about forgiveness and, and old hurts is I might think I have nothing going on for some, something that happened to me when I was eight or nine. It's called a pain body. And it lays back in here in the, in the mind. You know, the predator, the most dangerous thing in the whole world for me is my thinking, my, my own mind, which follows me wherever I go. It's always trying to figure stuff out and always wants me dead, will settle for me drunk. And there were things that happened to me as a kid. I watched my mom drink herself to death to suicide, and it would bother me and then go away. It would come up and go away. The holidays would show up, and I'd get tearful. I'd get angry. I'd get shame, and then it'd go away. And I thought I was getting better with it. It just goes dormant. The old hurts, the old pains, they go dormant. Do you ever drive in your car and an old song comes on and you go right back to when that song came out? You're like there, you can almost smell where you are. The people are there, right? You can, it's all there. Or a scent, it takes you right back. This thing called the pain body, these things that haven't been worked through, we haven't turned to God, we haven't done step work, they go dormant. And then something happens to us an altercation, uh, a, a breakup, even a song on the radio, and we go from calm to rage where the people look at us and they know who we are. What is going on with you? That thing woke up, and it might be the size of a mustard seed, but as the power of an army. It will take us over, and it will level everything in its path. And what it is is fear, striking out, just get everyone because we're scared to death. And we do this. Please help me, no, stay away. Please help me, no, stay away. We do this. Please help, come, please, I'm dying, no, stay away. The pain body. And the only way I got to see that was through lots and lots and lots of inventory and being brutally honest on paper and brutally honest with my sponsor. And then I surrender because that was really showing me how broken I am after so many years in Alcoholics Anonymous, 10, 15 years in AA. Did I really let my mom off the hook for doing what she did? Was I willing to let this guy who, who, who did bad things with me off the hook and forgive? Can I forgive this person for what they did? Not forget. Not a fool. Book, big Book says God gave us brains to use. I'm not a fool. They're not going to do that again to me. But can I let, just let them be? Can I let myself off the, can I step out of that old drama? Well, welcome to the NFL. Most of us are not willing to do that. In fact, a lot of, as I'm saying this, I lay off to me today because a bunch of folks saying, well, it's easy for you to, you don't know what happened to me. You don't know what I went through. I was, this was done to me. That was, how dare you even speak like, that's my story. And if you're experiencing that, how attached you are to the past and we won't get free. There's your stumbling blocks. How free do we want to be? Not that, I'm not, and please understand, I'm not saying forget that stuff as if it never happened. That's not what I'm saying. But are we willing to heal from that and step out of it finally? And when I'm able to step out of that, I become a much more effective agent for the person who's still in that wound, who's still in that hurt. Because I'm truly walking a spiritual path. Step 11. Incredible things. I suffer from, from a kid, a bad belly. Um, they have a name for it. Um, from the time I was a kid. Kindergarten. Fifth grade. Third grade. A uh, couple of accidents when I was a little kid. Mortified in school. Bad belly. And... Um, 
from time to time it flares up, but not so much anymore. I take my meds when I need to, and it's I kind of go about my life. But there was a time in early sobriety, I remember being on the phone uh, with my doctor, double, it was right around Thanksgiving time, and I was doubled over on the phone, and he says, well, I'll call in a prescription for you for this medicine. If this doesn't work, we're, I don't know what, we're going to have to do something else. And he says, I can't even make it out of my house. I'm, I'm going to call an ambulance. That's where I was taken with these, this, this ailment. And um, so I go on this medication. They did all sorts of testing. Well... Mark H. was my sponsor. My current sponsor is Mickey. I'm from Colorado. And they knew about this condition. And they said, we're not negating the fact that you might have some medical stuff going on there. But we're wondering how much of the wounds that you haven't released are causing this kind of stuff. This dis-ease and discomfort that gets manifested in, oh my God. Well, I don't want to believe, I don't want to hear this. I have a bad belly. I need medication. This is, this is serious. This is medical. Right, okay. They put me through the ringer with step work and sent me for some outside help. And little by slow, the demons got released, the demons got released, the demons got released. I was scared to death because I was so used to holding on to and nurturing my, my hurts and my wounds and my mom and my, the, the, the sexual violations and, and my story, Peter Marinelli, it's been tough for me and I'm a warrior. And uh, it was little by slowly released. Does my belly act up from time to time? Yeah. Is it a regular occurrence? Absolutely not. Because a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff has been healed. There was a time I'd go to the podium and I would start talking and God would give me words to say. Well, my mom suffered from alcoholism and drug addiction, committed suicide. And part of me was, that's my story. I survived that. Now I just say it. That's just part of my story. There's no identification with it. I'm not hooked into that anymore. My mom looked at it as a woman was sick and suffering what we suffer from. But I'm not walking around with this mom story around um, over my back anymore. That's a great freedom. And I'm able to look at my dad with all the cracks in his armor. There's a warrior for you, as loyal as they come. There's no, no one on the planet I'd rather be in a foxhole with than this guy, because one way or the other, you're getting out. You know. But he was larger than life. He was everything. You know, John Wayne, Tony Soprano, Mickey Mantle, they was everything. One, I mean, this is unbelievable. How do I even deal with a guy like this? No wonder why I was so afraid of him. And I was able, through healing, look at him as just flesh and blood. Wonderful man but cracks in the armor. And just yes, I was able to see his humanness. I could even sense some of his fears and concerns about things. That seven going on 77, he's looking at his own mortality, he's nervous about that. I can get that. There was a time ago, oh, no, it can't be. He can't be afraid of anything. This is, how real is that? How in touch am I with life when I'm living like that compared to where God has brought me to? The thing about being on a spiritual path, we're more in touch with others. We're more uh, in touch with someone's hurt and pain. We think we're immune because I'm spiritual, nothing bothers me. Well, it's not going to push me around, but I'm more alive, more in touch with others. That's how we become effective agents for God. Make sense? Eleven step, what a great piece of work. And we need to understand when they put this book together, these guys weren't sober like 30 years. They weren't involved in therapy. They weren't going off only to spiritual retreats that we have now, silent retreats. By the way, you heard there's a woman's retreat. It's a silent retreat for women. I want to see this. <laughs> little joke, sorry. They didn't have that. They didn't have that. They were working as hard as they could, and they put some ideas on paper, not knowing the impact of the 11th step, that it was truly God-inspired. Right? It's a couple of pages in the 11th step. So when I first uh, started meditating, it was about uh, <clears throat> two minutes. There was a, a, a friend of a friend who got me involved in uh, Meditation. This woman belonged to an ashram, and her whole life was meditation and, and things like that, different religion. But she was really, she looked like alive and healthy and clean. And she loved what AA did, and I was introduced to her, and she gave me instructions on how to meditate. 
And she put me on a timer for two minutes to meditate. And she told me about posture and breath, which everything I've ever studied talks about posture and breath. A lot of times uh, I watch folks meditate, um, even if it's before a meeting, like we're going to do three minutes of meditation, legs across, arms are folded, books on, the, you know, sunglasses in the head. I mean, it's bizarre. You can't do that. And even if it's for two minutes, make it two minutes. It may be the only two minutes you get to lock in ever. Well, I'll meditate tomorrow morning. I'll get serious. No, get serious now. And so the idea would, would, is, with posture and breath is, how am I sitting for meditation? Can I, do I have to sit in a chair because I can't uh, uh, get into a lotus position? That's fine. Do I have a meditation mat? Do I have a place I go to in my home for meditation? Have I created a space, my space, to go and seek this power and worship this power and get silent? Do I have, like, my trinkets, my AA stuff, maybe my religious articles, and have a little spot in my room, and I have a, a, a meditation mat and a cushion on top of it. I have a little altar and all the things that are important to me. Spiritual, religious, diff even different religions, all placed out there. A lot of times folks in AA give me these little trinkets. They're there. My rosary, beer, everything's out. I have my candles, my sage, everything's there. Sometimes I light it, sometimes I don't. But it's my space. And I have my books. Create a space. Give it some dignity. We're talking about going to God here. This is the guy. So when you start doing that, you'll say, how did I pray driving to work? What... what what was that? That was my prayer time, driving down 95. This is how I seek God. What a, I mean, where's my dignity? Not that God could get insulted, but if God was a human being, he'd be highly insulted. This is how you talk to me? While you're on, you're texting and you're talking to me. That's what it looks like. So I would start off on two minutes, and she put me on a timer, and she told me to work with it. And it's real simple. If you, if, even if you're sitting in a chair, you should have comfortable clothes on, not shoes or heels or any, just comfortable clothes, like sweatpants and stuff, loose clothes. And go to the same place every morning. Um, what I like to do is anytime I move into a new place, I meditate and ohm in every room. I'll burn sage in every room. But I have my spot. And if, if you're right-handed, you put your right hand like this and your left hand on top, and it's kind of like this, right below your navel where there's a chakra. And your feet are flat. You drop your shoulders. Your head will fall to God gave us a natural kind of position to drop. You don't look up and you don't look down. Just kind of like this. We will breathe without having to remember to breathe. And that's what you want to lock into. And it's simple. Breathing in one, breathing out two. Breathing in one, breathing out two. See the breath, feel the breath, count the numbers, we get away from the mind. And the first time I did that, two minutes was forever, and I was thinking about everything. Now, some of us might say, well, that's ridiculous. I don't have time to do that. I have time to drink. I have time to take up ten minutes from the floor sharing about my drama today and wasting the meeting's good time, but I don't have two minutes to go tonight when I get home. Well, sign falls on, I'll meditate tomorrow. <laughs> I'm busy. I'm really tired. I, I'll, I'll start tomorrow. We're always starting some tomorrow. But if our drug dealer or a bartender, we would not wait till tomorrow. We'd be out there now looking for them. So it takes two minutes tonight. Just go, go lock yourself in the bathroom. You know, we've got kids running around. Just put, go in the bathroom. I mean, I tell people, my sponsees, go in the bathroom. Lock the door. No one's going to come in. Two minutes. Kneel, sit on the floor. I don't care. And just work with this. Or you can put your palms up on, on top of your lap. If you do that, just pay attention to the energy and the blood flowing. Lift your palms up off your lap and you'll feel the pulsing. It'll take you away from thinking. Just work with breath. Breathing in one, breathing out. Breathing in one, breathing out two. Breathing in one. Like this. Two minutes. Then make it three minutes. Then make it four minutes. Then make it five minutes. Then make it six minutes. Then make it eight minutes. And a few weeks go by. You don't need a timer because you're locked in. And then you say, how could I do without it? When I experience some joy, I realize how angry I was. When I experience love, I realize how much hate I had. Yeah, we walk around with hate even though we're sober. Watch CNN News, hate. Watch Fox News, hate. Us against them. <clears throat> but we claim spirituality from the podium. Experience some silence, we realize how, how noisy we were. Experience some freedom, how attached I 
was to me and my drama and my story and my, you know, that kind of stuff. Do I have to share at every meeting I go to? Burning desire. My hand constantly going off for burning desire. I got a problem, don't I? Do you have to share at every meeting? That's why I love some of the old timers. They will go to the, the pillars of our community. They'll just sit in the back like elder statesmen, like my friend right here, and just watch us. And when a newbie comes in, boom, she's on him. What can I do for you? She did that for Marion. Did for Marion was no. Pillar, that's how we operate. But if I have to so I gotta share because I had a bad day today, I'm gonna share, and I gotta participate in the eleven step because I'm guru, so I, you know, I got some stuff going on, don't I? And the thing about working with meditation, when it becomes a practice, it becomes part of who I be, it be the, the practice becomes me, is I will start to operate that way throughout the day. I'm listening instead of speaking. I'm observing instead of reacting. And I'm clear that I'm known by my creator, that I walk with my creator. And then I get to see, she may not know it, he may not know it, but I know they walk with their creator. So when people offend me and they say bad things like happened to me this morning by a dear friend who just just dropped a grenade on my lap, I can walk away and say, forgive him, he doesn't know what he's doing. And not coming from a spiritual hilltop or a condescending tone, but just understanding it for what it is. Did it hurt? Absolutely it hurt hurt my heart. But I don't hurt tonight. I understand it. So how am I doing with my love and stuff? Hmm? What would you do and speak so loud you can't hear a word I'm saying? The Thomas Merton said that. My grand sponsor would walk into a room, bless his heart, he's gone home to God. Don P. would walk in, just walk in. His eyes were like headlights. Big blue eyes. His smile was just, I gotta get near this guy. I don't know what he's doing, I just gotta get around this man. His sponsor, Gary Brown, my great grand sponsor, as humble and quiet as they come, but when he speaks, it has power. He doesn't have to speak. He'll sit through a whole conference and not say one word unless he's called upon. These are effective agents for God. They walk with that quiet voice. Walk softly and carry a big book. There's a bumper sticker that says that. Right? Don't need to share it every meeting. Don't need to talk. I'm clear on what I walk with. I'm clear so I can hear. I'm clear of my feet. I know where they are. I'm grounded. And I'm accountable to people. I'm not sharing to get your approvals. Great share. That was good. So I go home to look at me. I'm, I, yeah, great share. Everyone said so. I'm validated now. The seeking validation is a scary way to go because what I'm using is human power rather than the power. It's nice to get a pat on the back and applause. It's wonderful. But if I'm dependent upon that, where's God in all of that? So my practice now is, um, I think I've shared this. It's three times a day. My afternoon, uh, I was talking to a young lady, and I said, my afternoon probably work with these beads. It's about 10 minutes. It's longer than 10 minutes. I, I, I told you it was 10 minutes. It's actually longer than that. Uh, I, I, 10 minutes, it's, it's longer than that. Um, but I, <laughs> more like a half hour. <laughs> um, it isn't an effort to do it, though. Oh, i got to go. It's like, how do I not do that? And I, and I think I share with you guys in the afternoon, I'll, I'll pull into Publix Park a lot, I'll go down by the co, I don't care. I'll just lock my doors, shut it down, and uh, do what I do. And then I go back to work. And everyone knows I disappear. Whether it's on my lunch hour, a little bit of a break, a little low on the schedule. It used to be, I used to be very strict with three o'clock. That was my time to go do that. But work changes that around. So at some point, sometimes it's one o'clock, sometimes one thirty, sometimes it's four, sometimes it's eleven thirty, but I will get that time. But on awakening to set up my day is I go into prayer and meditation. And I give it the time it's supposed to. And I used to time it. It was 10 minutes and 20 minutes, and it was a one minute per hour, so it was 24 minutes. I went through all of this stuff, seeking, seeking, seeking. And then one day it was made abundantly clear to me, let him determine how long he needs to be in meditation. Sometimes 10 minutes is more than enough. Sometimes I need to be there in more time. I've been in meditation for a really long time. Really long time. And sometimes it's just 10 minutes. 
on the average, it's about 15, 20 minutes I'm in meditation. I don't pay attention to time anymore. And what I've just started doing recently is I'm up at 5, 5.30 in the morning. Marion gets me nuts. Um, but I, I get up early and I do my stuff. And right before I'm out to work, I just been moved late and I pay attention to it just to sit with, on the mat and just, just kind of check in with God again. I get a few more minutes be, before I go out the door. And that is starting to become a practice. I just did it once and twice and now it's a thing. I work with anointing oil. It's something that I, it's just something that I've been moved to work with. And these things I'm doing now are just part of the practice for me. My 11 said is very dear to me, very sacred to me. In fact, I gotta be honest, I'm even uncomfortable talking about some of these things. Not because I don't want to share them, I just, they're very personal to me, but my job is to share what I do. And I'm not sharing to say, look at me. It's, it's not what this talk is about. I'm just kind of letting you into my life a little bit. So I work with anointing oil. I've been burning sage again. It's just what I do. It doesn't say in the big book. But it says, be quick to see where religious people are right, make use of what they offer. So some people burn sage. I've been doing that forever. I shut it down for a while. I've been doing that. And I've been back to lighting this one particular candle. Just this one specific candle. And that's just part of my deal in the morning. It's very, very quiet in my house. I'm very, very quiet. And the fun thing is if, if you're with someone who's on the same path where they're reading scripture and you're reading scripture and you're reading big book and they're reading big book and it's kind of like this thing. It's just kind of, what a great thing to experience. And then tonight when I get home, I, you know, I'll settle in and I'll, I'll disappear into my room and um, I'll uh, thank, thank my father for, you know, a great day no matter what went on. Finally, um, and I don't want to get into breaking traditions, but for new folks, um, especially young folks, I'm running into a lot of young folks who don't even know what their religious origin is. Now, when I was growing up, everyone knew. You knew if you were Jewish, you knew if you were a Catholic, you knew if you, whatever it was. You knew. I mean, whether you observed those, uh, uh, that or not, it was a, not the point. You knew. When you were in grade school, um, we knew who we were. And I see the 20-something kids coming into recovery, and I talk to them, well, what religion back? I, I, I don't know. How could you not know? I think I'm Catholic. Were you baptized? I think I'm Jewish. Did you, what do you mean you think? How could you think? Well, we have no, what do you mean you have no religion? And it's really kind of a, 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 a represents what's going on right now. I mean, we're becoming a, a secular country. We look more like other countries than America. And to come into AA and we're told to follow God, you will catch some grief for that. God is a bad word right now. Talking about a religion is a bad thing right now. It's not popular. And you come into AA and say, God, higher power, God of your understanding, go pray. Read the big book, it encourages us to go back to our religion. That's not a popular thing. And for new folks coming in in their 20s, this is wow. What? None of my friends do this. I wasn't brought up with this. Talk about God at a diner to civilians. They'll just ignore you. <laughs> oh no, he's going to talk about this. Oh, you're a Jesus freak. Oh Lord, how mercy. <laughs> this one's got the star of David on the head of me. You know what I mean? It's just not popular. Watch the news for 10 minutes. And they're pulling God out of everything. And we're all falling on our ass in, in the world right now. I mean, it's, it's a mess. There's a connection between those two. So we get new folks come into AA, and we're talking about God. Go talk about God. We go shout it from the rooftops. And those who want it will fall, and those who don't, you pray for them. You go get God. You experience his power, and you will, you will really be in line. You will be full for the first time. You will be enlightened. You will be joyful. You will be free. You go find God. You go talk about God. You experience God. Go share God. Just talk about God. If no one wants to hear, that's okay. We do in AA, believe it or not. We want to talk about God in AA. That's what they did here. You speak to some of our old timers. They'll tell you the stories when they came in. Get God. Go get God. Experience God. 
And that's why a lot of folks are dying in AA, and a lot of folks have no idea of what's behind step 11 because they don't talk about God. There's a fellowship. I was talking to a gentleman today from another fellowship, and he says they don't even like the word God in that fellowship. They refer to just as higher power. You can't say God. People will get annoyed. I said, what kind of fellowship is this? What do you mean? And so we study comes of age in some of our history books, and we see the richness in that. I can tell how good I'm doing, not but what I own, but what I don't need. What I don't need is to get caught up in controversy and gossip and what's popular. What I do need is a relationship with God. And that makes me feel at home wherever I go. Step 11. How's our prayer life? How's our meditative life? How's my nightly review doing? And am I passing this on? Am I getting God and getting the effects by God, but afraid to share God from a podium because I'm looking for approval from others? Am I sharing God from the floor? You know, am I talking about God or am I afraid of, well, I'm going to catch some resistance to some of the folks in my meeting? So what? God didn't deny you when you showed up on that day and got sober. You're going to deny him. That's all I got. Peace. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.